Cool. Thanks, everyone, for joining my talk. Uh, I really appreciate that you have interest in my research. So the talk is titled Optimistic Provide, making the IPFS DHT provide process an order of magnitude faster. And I'm very excited about this project because I don't think there are many established algorithms that have so much improvement um, yeah, opportunities as this one right um, by now. And yeah. So about me, I'm, yeah, my name is Dennis, as Marco already just said. I'm, I'm a research, so I'm a PhD student at, a student at the University of Göttingen. And I'm also a PhD fellowship recipient. You can reach me under these handles on GitHub or Twitter. And I'm, yeah, feel free to reach out after the talk. All right, for this, for this talk, um, I think we need to get on the same page for, um, of how the provide, providing content in IPFS works, especially um, how this plays together with the DHT. And after we've done that, I will just um, I will show you where the improvement opportunities lie, and then uh, give or yeah, present two proposals of how we want to tackle this, and then show some first measurement results, and also at the end show you some next steps. All right. <clears throat> so when we, when we start at the beginning, let's imagine you have a file it's called my file, and you head to the command line, and then you type ipfs add my file. IPFS would chunk the file into different, uh, well, into different chunks, construct a Merkle DAG, calculate a CID, and then IPFS starts advertising the CID to the DHT. And this is, so how does IPFS actually do this? I think to understand this, we need a very brief primer on distributed hash tables. I probably won't do justice uh, on this topic, but I will give my best. Um, for every, anyone curious, I highly recommend the paper, as Ma uh, Max also did yesterday. Um, it's, I think it's a very approachable read. But anyways, so a distributed hash table is basically a distributed system that maps keys to values. And in the case of IPFS, it does two things. Well, actually three, but two relevant things for us right now. Um, it maps CIDs to peer IDs, and then in, which we call provider records. And the second one is uh, it maps peer IDs to network addresses. So looking up content in IPFS is actually a two-step process. First, we look up the peer ID that hosts or claims to host the files. And then we look up their network addresses to actually be able to reach it. And in the case of Cadimlia, one so, so the implementation that IPFS uses, um, Cadimlia defines a couple of system parameters. And the important ones are like a projection. So it projects the CID and PRD to a common address space by using a SHA-256 hash. And it also, the, the second important thing here is that it also defines a metric, which gives us an ordering for the peers or CIDs in this space. And with these things in place, um, IPFS constructs a routing table locally. It holds peers with um, specific distance units in, uh, of multiples of two in, uh, locally. And um, by doing this, we can, uh, with every iteration on looking up content, we can actually go, um, get closer by a factor of two and half the, half the distance in every iteration. And yeah, we don't only store one peer for each distance unit, but also uh, yeah, a couple of peers because of churn, and I will get to this in a second as well. And with these system parameters and also network parameters, um, these parameters drive the routing table and the lookup algorithm. And the lookup algorithm in IPFS is um, actually in our case, so for this providing content uh, use case, we want, to we want to find the closest peer to a specific CID. And um, it starts with we load the 20 closest peers from our routing table to, I, I would call it a query queue. Then we ask the closest one of the peers that we know to, um, yeah, if, if that particular peer knows anyone closer to the CID, we get results back, we sort it into our query queue, we take the next closest, we ask that one, order it into our query queue, and we continue until the closest known three peers have been um, successfully queried, and then we terminate. Um, so that's the gist of it, basically. And this is just a, um, this is how such a process could look like. So we have the time on the x-axis in seconds, and on the y-axis, the different peers that have, we have contacted in, in such an operation. And um, well, as you can see, it's, such, it's, it's quite an involved process. We are contacting many peers. 
Um, we're timing out in a couple of uh, cases, so the red lines are actually just the dial operations, and uh, the green bars are the actually RPC calls to those nodes. And if we do this, so in the past we have done some measurements. So we have um, deployed some IPFS nodes all around the world in different AWS regions. And we have instructed those nodes to just generate random content and provide it to the network. And then just measured the time that it took, well, to, yeah, to provide this content, to advertise this content to, or the CIDs to the network from the user, from, from the user's perspective. So when, so there's a user facing API and we just measured the time that it took to provide the content. And we can see uh, on the right-hand side, basically just the numbers from the left graph. So on, in the left graph, we have the, again, the time on the uh, x-axis and then a CDF on the y-axis. I think more, pro uh, more clear is the uh, table on the right-hand side. We can see that in, so the 50th percentile is at around 30 seconds. So in 50% of the cases, uh, it took around 30 seconds from, from all from all regions um, to provide content, and it gets even worse, obviously, for the 90th and 95th percentile, up to, I don't know, two minutes almost. Well, even over two minutes. Oops, sorry. And this, so there are a couple of reasons why that's the case. Um, I think one of the most important reasons is node churn, so that in these routing, so we are getting um, results from remote peers from their routing tables, and it could be the case that they have stale entries because nodes churn in the network. Um, here are three graphs that show the node churn. Let's just look at the left hand, um, yeah, of the, of the, at the leftmost graph. Um, it shows the uptime in hours and then the percentage of peers that actually stay that long in the, in the network. And we, we, so on the left hand, in the left graph, you can see that um, after two hours, almost 50% of the peers that have joined the network have actually already uh, left it, and um, I mean, Kademlia prefers or favors nodes that are quite stable in the network, but anyways, um, we will definitely get stale records from uh, from remote peers during the lockup process that um, that slows down the whole provide uh, operation. But if we then take a look at, um, so I may have forgot to say, so after we have found the, um, the closest peers to a particular CID, we store the provider record at at those at the 20 closest peers we have found but if you just have a look at how long it actually took to discover those peers so we went through the whole process looking up the closest peers then stored the provider records and if we just take a look how long it took to discover those peers we can see that it it's almost so so in over 90 percent of the cases we discovered those peers in under one second so we have again the time on the x-axis and then the CDF on the on the y-axis. Um, yeah, well, we see that we actually don't need to go through the whole process, which takes a minute or two, um, to really be sure to have found the closest peers. We could have just actually finished after, let, let's say, a second or a half a second in over 90% of the cases. And so so this, these were measurements in the past, and so the takeaways here are, well, the publication process right now operates in the order of minutes, but actually the dis discovery of the closest peers happens in the order of seconds or even sub-seconds. And so there's a, a huge improvement opportunity there. And the idea is that we accept a little inaccuracy and just store provider records optimistically during the provide process itself um, before we are actually done with the, with the lookup process until the end. And so there, then we came up with two different approaches. The one, the, the first one is that we just, I will go into both of them in a second, um, that we run multiple queries until they intersect. This is actually some idea from Petar, the, one of the original authors from the Kademlia paper. And then a second one is just that we estimate how suitable appears during the provide process. And well, we estimate the suitability of their closeness and uh, to store the, uh, to, to hold the provider records based on the network size. And yeah, if we start with the first approach, or well, with the first improvement proposal, the idea is that we um, start multiple lookup procedures in parallel. They are independent, so they don't interfere with each other. We are running them concurrently. And the crucial thing is that they start from a different set of seed peers. So on the um, bottom right, you can see the routing table. And the idea would be that we just take the 
20 closest peers from our routing table and the 20 clo uh, furthest peers and run the lookup process, a uh, procedure in parallel and just stop as soon as both query queues have an intersection of let's say 10 peers. Then we abort both queries, choose those 10 peers to hold the provider record and call it a day. Um, so yeah, so that's the first idea. The second one would be a proximity estimation. Um, at the bottom, the horizontal line should, um, is the address space. And let's imagine you want to provide a CID which falls somewhere on this line. You perform this lookup procedure, you come across a peer, which is also here somewhere else on the line. Then depending on the network size, so in this case, it's quite sparse. And depending on the network size, we can estimate how likely is it, is it that there's another peer that's even closer than the one that we have just discovered. And well, in this case, it's quite unlikely, it's, it's quite sparse, but if the network is a little bit denser, if the network size is a little bit um, higher, um, we would probably need to have another hop to, um, to be sure that um, there we won't, probably won't find anyone closer. And this improvement proposal will include two estimators. The first one is ne in network size, so we cannot, so right now, if, when you're just participant of the network, you don't know how large the network is. And the second one is just an estimator for the proximity. And uh, yeah, define a threshold. What's the threshold after which we can say, well, we probably won't find anyone closer than the peer we have just discovered. All right, some measurements results on both approaches. They are all preliminary, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, these, uh, both of these graphs show the average distance of the set of 20 closest peers that we have found in the lookup procedure. So imagine we have uh, finished the lookup procedure and if we take the, the, the set of closest, uh, the, the 20 closest peers and take the average distance of those 20 peers to the CID that we actually want to, to provide um, and do, yeah, and, and do, I don't know, a here in this case, a thousand provider operations and graph them in this particular way. So we have the distance on the x-axis and again, uh, the percentage or CDF on the y-axis, we can see that in the status quo, so in the current implementation, the distances are, are way lower than in this multi-query approach. So it, it operates in the order of 0.06 normed XOR percent. I won't go into that right now, but in, you, you can see that in the multi-query approach, it's in the order of two or four or six, six percent, which is an indication that these queries intersect too early and that the distances of the peers that we have discovered uh, or have chosen are too far away and that they are more, uh, it's highly likely that there are more closer peers uh, that should have stored the provider records for us. Um, for the proximity estimation, um, as I said, there are two estimators. The first one would be the network size. And uh, I came across this awesome blog post, which I've linked uh, on the bottom right, I, um, which proposes a way to estimate the network, si network size locally. So in the literature, you find a lot of approaches where um, you gossip around, you ask your peers what their view of the network is and how large they think the network is. And uh, this would incur a networking cost and I wanted to avoid this. And so there's an approach which avoids all of that. And I re um, highly recommend also reading this. Um, I implemented this, and so this is, uh, these, this is the data of an IPFS node that is just running on my local machine, and it's just listening into the network, <coughs> and based on, on some operations that the IPFS node is doing anyways, it can infer kind of the network size here. So the blue line, so on the x-axis is just the time, um, the time of day, and on the y-axis is the estimated network size, the blue line is the average, and then we have the first um, yeah, one standard deviation, two standard deviations, and three in the shaded areas. And if we compare this with the numbers that the, that the network crawl gives us, it kind of fits nicely. At least the, the order of magnitude is right, and uh, I think it's a pretty, pretty good estimate. The next step would be, is the estimate good enough? This is one of the next steps. I think this is a very promising result. Um, you can, at the bottom, you can also see, so the, the green line is the total number of nodes we have found in the network during the times of the days. It's also, it revolves around 2,000, 20,000, 
and it's in, in the same ballpark as the local estimate above, which, which is, I think, a very promising result already. Also, the closeness of the chosen peers is also in the same order of magnitude this time um, compared to the multi-query approach. It's not the same um, shape <laughs> as in the current implementation, but I also think this is a promising first result. It's, it's, it's preliminary, and the next steps would be just to experiment with all the parameters that we, that we have, all the, um, all the switches that, are, that we can tweak to just see their impact on the on the closeness and so on. So for instance, for the multi-query approach, we can run three queries instead of two, or we can increase the size of the intersection. And for the proximity, uh, proximity estimator, we can just, um, uh, we can improve up upon the uh, network size estimate with, with some other parameters. And uh, so the next step would be to evaluate the network size estimate across a, a fleet of IPFS nodes from in different peer space as address spaces. Um, locations in the address space. And in general, what I've not shown right now are the actual publications, publication durations, which is actually what matters in the end. And yeah, these are all the next steps. There's a repository that you can uh, look all these uh, graphs up and all the information. And uh, well, thank you. Happy to t take questions. <laughs> Any question? Right. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this was maybe something that I missed, but you are focusing on doing the store operation, right? The provide. Right, yeah. And what I was wondering in your presentation is if you are not storing the provider records in the K, close, in the K closest nodes, right, to that content ID, are you not making it difficult to finding them? At right, least, yeah. At least from a different point of the network? Right, right. Um, what the multi-query approach is actually, so the idea was that we are simulating a, a second, a second lookup and just empirically verifying that it will come across the same nodes while we are heading towards the, to the, uh, to the CID, but uh, in general, so we, we accept this little inaccuracy that we don't probably may not find the closest peers to the to the CID, but this is, should be there's also some of the next steps. This should be fine in most of the cases with like a certain statistical error. And yeah, one, one of the steps would be to just to run it a couple of thousand times and see what the lookup looks like if if there are actually occasions where we miss miss the CID. And also when you look up content, um, well you, you, you have also parallel queries and you're querying a lot of peers for, for, for these provider records, so it's actually quite likely that you will will find it anyways, although we haven't stored the provider records with the closest ones. Hey Dennis, thanks yeah, for, the, yeah. for the talk. Uh, one thing that I was wondering is when you are doing the thing where you start two queries on different points and you find an intersection of 10 and you go for those 10, right. why don't go for the 30? Exactly, yeah. If you go oh. for the 30, like the intersection should be... Oops. Yeah, this is what I meant with n ah, the number okay. of parallel queries. So this is, this is in a, yeah, a natural evolution on the first uh, measurement. Just do three or four queries and then uh, also tweak the intersection, right? To yeah, totally, yeah, absolutely. Hi, Dennis. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, so basically what you are proposing is, if I understood the, the talk correctly, is you are exchanging uh, 2% inaccuracy or, or X percent inaccuracy right. for an order of magnitude performance benefit, basically, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether um, you have made a figure or kind of experiment where you, s you, you can show, for example, on the X axis, this is the error or inaccuracy percentage, and this is the performance speed up that I get for this oh, nice. inaccuracy. So I think right. it, that would be nice if you have that. Do you, do you look at it? Um, I haven't considered this yet, but this would be a great graph just to see where a speed, sweet spot would probably be. Yeah, but I, I haven't done this. But um, doing these, as like proper, so so this, the size is just just one one thing on, on errors here. One thing for the size estimation is so I added the standard deviations here because those errors propagate to the threshold that we define to for the closest peers, and so I already have kind of a mind that we need to have like an, a number for the errors that we make mm -hmm. uh, with selecting those peers. So in, yeah, 
to totally we need we need a number so of how big is the error and uh, yeah what what performance benefits we get from this and having this on a continuous scale would be nice yeah Uh, Dennis, just curious, do you know the impact of being wrong about the network size? Um, so I suspect it, so I suspect as the network grows, the impact gets lower, which is a good thing. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about this. Um, yeah, so this, this may be already the answer. So I don't, I don't really, I, c I cannot really tell what the impact of the network size is right now. It's just my intuition that it gets uh, that, that the estimator gets more tolerant to network size estimate errors the larger the network is. But I cannot prove it right now with any, any graph. It's just my, the intuition. Yeah, so. Hi, th thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, uh, I know you can't necessarily prove or like test out with uh, larger nodes in the network or like a larger amount of nodes in the network, but um, have you tried this algor estimator algorithm with uh, nodes or a smaller amount of nodes in the network and see if that it holds for true for smaller networks? Yeah. No, I haven't done this yet, and I, I'm also not sure how to do it. It, it. it could probably work if I simulated the network in test ground, maybe. Um, but yeah, um, like the so how, how these how this estimate operates in the limits is is yeah one of the next step. As I was also just said, we need to look how this network size estimate performs when the network grows, but also when the network shrinks. So at, w at which point it gets the, 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 um, the estimate too wrong or too far off the actual size. Or yeah, would need to, yeah, probably test ground would be a nice, nice tool to do that, test with smaller networks. If you, uh, great talk. If you had uh, a way to test whatever you wanted in production, like what, what would be the things you tested? Or like what would be the experiments you set up? Well, okay, that's a good point. So all of this is tested in production. And one of the, the cool things about this, uh, the, both of these approaches is that they don't need a network upgrade by any means, no system parameter or network parameter update, but it's just users could update their clients and benefit from new functionality and new performance. And so, so this is already tested with in production, if that was your question. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I guess specifically like only you are running and updating your K buckets this way, but what if like the network was doing it? Like how would the network be affected? Well, okay, so then, so one inaccuracy that we buy into with at least the estimator approach that um, could be that we are storing provider records with more than the desired 20 peers. It could be that we find a peer, store the provider records, but then within the next uh, lookup iteration, we find e 20 even closer ones, and then we use store, with, um, store the provider records with them. So one impact could be that we have a slight increase of provider records and just store a, yeah, a little more provider records than is actually desirable. But it could also be the other way around, that if we tweak the threshold in the other direction, that we could yeah, just store the provider records with 18 peers, and maybe this would, in the, in the mean, would even out. So this yeah, could be considered, yeah, needs to be considered as well, yeah. I think we are done with the question. The next talk will be about quick with Martin. Thank you. Thank you.